Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi everyone and Ramadan Mubarak inshallah to all of you. Audhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa alihi al-tahirin. First of all, why did I choose the story of Musa as the manifestation of the limitless mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Because what we see in this story is both sides, Musa and Fir'aun, are dealt with mercy and compassion by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course, mercy because he should be supported. Musa, he, he should be supported by God's mercy for his mission. And Pharaoh is dealt with mercy for a long time before it becomes quite clear that he is going to stand against the mercy of God for others. This uh, uh, hadith that we have, Ya man sabaqat rahmatuhu ghadabah, O one whose mercy has preceded his wrath, tells us that God's wrath is not out of vengeance or a feeling of wrath or uh, trying to retaliate against something. No. If he has wrath on some people, it's because of mercy on others. Because he wants others to live safe, to live secure, to live and prosper under his blessings and even uh, I think once we discussed about why the hell is there is of course wrath of God and some people but that is a wrath preceded by mercy because if those people are dead loose and come out of hell they would destroy the life of others that's why they are kept there and they are of course punished to come to their minds, maybe they are saved and come back. So this wrath is preceded by mercy. The wrath of God is preceded by His mercy. Actually, it's His mercy which produces that wrath. And of course, we know that if you want to go deeper in theology, these terms, mercy, wrath, these are the attributes of act of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It doesn't have anything to do with His essence, with His own that. Uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala and there is no change in him there is nothing that we can say now he's merciful now he's full of wrath no it's just the way he behaves so that the final good comes about from which we find out what is wrath what is mercy why some are punished anyhow these are theoretical issues we want to go to a story now and this is uh, the method of the Qur'an. He teaches us about attributes of God. He teaches us about how God behaves, what is his sunnah in dealing with his creatures through stories. And this is very good. Examples. We always need examples. Our mind is confused if we are not given examples about how things work. And that's why we have all these stories of the prophets and of other people in the Qur'an to tell us how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala treats his creatures, treats human beings. Now, the story of Musa is probably the, the most outstanding story in the Qur'an. Musa and Pharaoh, the most outstanding story. In many, many surahs, probably tens of surahs, this story comes up again and again because this is one of those very uh, outstanding examples of how Allah behaves when he is dealing with his creatures, those who reject, those who accept, those who are guided, those who are misguided. So the story is very uh, important in terms of our own understanding of where we stand. These are not only stories of the past people. These are said so that we can con contemplate and understand what is our relation to God. Having these examples, the example of Musa and Pharaoh, the example of Ibrahim and Namrud, the example of others, how we can position ourselves. So 
I hope that at the end of this story, at the end of these five nights, we may not come to the end of this story, of course, but at the end of these five nights, we can also uh, come to a good understanding of our position in the creation. Where do we stand? What is our relationship with the Lord, with other human beings? How we can conceptualize that? by using these stories. Now, as I said, the story of Musa, Musa and Pharaoh, Pharaoh alone, has come up in many, many surahs. But there are only two surahs in the Quran which deal with the story from the beginning, from the birth of Musa salam. And that is Surah Qasas, chapter 28, and Surah Taha, chapter 20. Only these two surahs give that story in full. Of course, the details are different from other surahs. However, it comes right from the beginning. It starts from the beginning to when, of course, Musa led Ben Israel out of Egypt. I would like you to recite these two surahs sometime during these five nights and see the difference in style. It's very beautiful. The difference in style of storytelling. I mean, if someone is familiar with the, with the art of storytelling and story writing, they would realize the difference between the two styles. Just a very simple example. Of course, the, the type of uh, literature is very different. The rhythm is very different, the rhyme is very different because of the, the way the story is looked at from different perspectives. However, one very conspicuous difference is that in one Surah Qasas, in that, that instance of Surah Qasas, the story starts right from the beginning and goes to the end. This is one style. It's beautiful in itself. Surah Taha uses the, another style. It doesn't start from the beginning. It starts from the middle of the story of Musa alayhi salam. وَهَلْ أَتَاكَ حَدِيثُ مُوسَى Have you heard about the story of Musa? إِذْ رَأَى نَارًا فَقَالَ لَأَحْلِهِمْ كُثُوا إِنِّي آنَسْتُ نَارًا When he saw a fire. So the story starts from when he is coming back from Madian. He saw that fire on the bush. And uh, he told his family to stay so that he can go perhaps bring some fire or bring some news about how to find their way. We'll talk about that later. And then it goes on where there's a flashback to the beginning of the story of Musa, his birth, the way his mother threw him into the river. So the style is very different. And you, if you compare the two styles of storytelling in Surah Qasas and in Surah Taha, you would find the beauties of each type and how the two types are rhymed differently, the rhythm of the storytelling is different. It's very beautiful for those who have this art of story writing and storytelling. Now, the story of Musa is linked with Banu Israel because he himself was one of Banu Israel. Who were Banu Israel? Banu Israel were the children of Israel, as of course the term says. Who was Israel? Israel was Yaqub. Yaqub was his name. Israel was his title. And in Hebrew, Israel meant worshipped God. So he was a man who worshipped God, Israel. And Quran uses the name as well. He uses the name Yaqub and he uses the name Israel. Kullu ta'am kana hillan libani Israel illa ma harrama Israelu ala nafsih. So Israel is a name used for Yaqub in the Quran itself. A man who worshipped God. And these Banu Israel were very important in the eyes of God. They were the chosen people, so to speak. As of course the Jews nowadays, they claim, and rightly they claim, that they were chosen people. No one denies that they were chosen people. However, what happened later, did they remain chosen or not, is something else that Quran speaks about it to us. These people were living in Egypt when Musa was born. 
What they were doing in Egypt, they did not belong to Egypt, of course. They were immigrants. And uh, they migrated to Egypt from nomadic life. They were shepherds, they were nomads. They didn't have any civilized sort of life. Coming to Egypt, which was the cradle of civilization, which was the cradle of culture, science, knowledge, philosophy, all these things, and suddenly Banu Israel coming from desert, coming from their shepherd life to this center, found themselves in a completely different environment. How did this come about? Because God wanted this to happen. The Egypt had civilization, the Egypt had science, the Egypt had knowledge, but they didn't have guidance. They were misguided. So, the story tells us, this is very interesting, it's not the case that always guidance is there with science and civilization. A civilization may be very powerful, very knowledgeable, without any guidance. They don't know what to do with their knowledge, with their science, with their civilization. So, on the other hand, these nomadic people, Banu Israel, they were the people who had prophets among them. Now, I want you to think about this. This is very important. Usually prophets came from these type of people. They didn't come from big civilizations. Yes, there was an encounter between prophets and big civilizations later. However, they were from pure people who had other outstanding features and qualities different from what people of power and civilization had. And these nomadic people, Yaqub and his children, they were living there in Egypt, in Canaan, in Palestine. And Allah wanted to bring them to Egypt and place them in the middle of the civilization so that the two could interact and learn from each other. It's very interesting, isn't it? Now, Muslims are coming to Europe to the cradle of civilization, so to speak. Probably Allah has a plan here. Allah wants a sort of interaction which, although it's a bit difficult at the beginning, but it may come true. It may come true one day. Not as tragic as what happened in Egypt, of course, but something good may come out of it. Now, how did this happen? Yeah, people thought with their small minds, they were plotting for their small desires, for their petty desires. The children of Yaqub, they plotted against their brother Yusuf, they wanted to kill him, and then they decided not to kill him, to put him at the bottom of a well, and then people, the, the caravans took Yusuf, they took him to Egypt. And this is how things came about. When Allah tells the story of Yusuf, saying that, look how Yusuf was placed at the center of the court in Egypt to give him power to establish him on the earth, then he says, Wallahu ghalibun ala amrihi, nas la ya'lamun. Allah is quiet in control of what he wants to do. The brothers, Yusuf brothers, they thought that they are plotting something, makaru, they did a makr, the deception, wa makar Allah, and Allah had his own plan. And the plan, of course, went forward. Yusuf came to Egypt. No, the story of Yusuf is completely different now. But when he was established there as the Aziz of Egypt, as the treasurer of the king, then the king told him, bring your family over. Everyone, bring everyone. And place them in the best place, in the best area of Egypt, of Memphis, or wherever you want to place them. You have your land, you, you are free to choose any place. And he brought his family. Yaqub and his children came to Egypt, and there was an area called Goshin, apparently, which later on became the city where Banu Israel lived in. They came and they were uh, accommodated there by the king, by Yusuf, and they lived there. They flourished, they learned, they are very clever people. They learned the knowledge, the science, civilization, everything. Gradually the whole Egyptian 
administration became dependent on these people. They became very wealthy, very wealthy. I don't know what, how these Jews work, <laughs> anyhow. I mean, you, you see the example of Barun mentioned in the Quran. He was cousin of Musa, alayhi salam. He was one of those Banu Israel living in Egypt. And Allah says, آتَيْنَاهُ مِنَ الْكُنُوزِ مَا إِنَّ مَفَاتِحَهُ لَتَنُوءُ بِالْأُسْبَةِ أُولِ الْقُوَّةِ he had so much treasures that even the keys for the safe places of those treasures were heavy for a strong group of men to carry. So how did he do it? How did Banu Israel do it there in Egypt? They became very wealthy. And it was not only that. It was not only that Allah decided to bring them in to Egypt. He made the chain of prophets to be situated in this nation from among other people. So they were given all bounties, they were brought to a nice place, they were given guidance, they were given prophethood. وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَا بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلَ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحُكْمَ وَالنُّبُوَّةِ وَرَزَقْنَاهُمْ مِنَ الطَّيِّبَاتِ This is in Surah Jathia. Look what Allah says about this Banu Israel. وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَا بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلَ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحُكْمَ وَالنُّبُوَّةِ وَرَزَقْنَاهُمْ مِنَ الطَّيِّبَاتِ وَفَضَّلْنَاهُمْ عَلَى الْعَالَمِينَ we just brought them high, higher than everyone else. Now, you may say, why? Why Banu Israel were given such a status? And, of course, later on, the Quran speaks about them in a language that all of us know. How Allah is angry with them, how Allah curses them, takes all the blessings from them, because the way they treated all these bounties. However, we are not going to to deal with this dark part of it, with the uh, tragic side of it, the good side of it. What Allah gave to Banu Israel. Why? Why Banu Israel were so hugely blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now look at the beginning of Surah Bani Israel. Surah number 17, chapter number 17, the Surah Isra or Bani Israel, it has two names. It says that وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَا مُوسَى الْكِتَابِ We gave Musa the book. وَجَعَلْنَاهُ هُدًا لِبَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ We made that book as a guidance to Banu Israel. Why? ذُرِّيَّةَ مَنْ حَمَلْنَا مَعَ نُوحَ They were the progeny of someone whom we had carried in the ark with Nuh. إِنَّهُ كَانَ عَبْدًا شَكُورًا Wow! It all goes back into deep history. No, he was a very thanksgiving, grateful servant. Because of his gratefulness, we blessed him and we blessed whoever was with him in the ark. This ayah always have perplexed me personally. Because Banu Israel are the Riyah to Nuh, the progeny of Nuh, aren't they? From Sam, he had three sons who boarded with him on the ark, and another son who didn't board, Sam, Ham, and Yafes. And Banu Israel are from Sam, and that's why they are called Semites. And we are all called Semites because we are from Sam. Now, Sam himself was a great man. However, here it doesn't say these were the Zurriya of Nuh or Zurriya of Sam. They were of course Zurriya of Nuh, but because they came from Sam, Allah doesn't mention Sam. Not mentionable, although he was a great man. But when Allah talks about Nuh, Sam is no one. Is no one. So these were these were the Zurriya of Someone who we took in the ark with Nuh. And Nuh was a thankful person. 
Sometimes I think with myself, you ponder as well, you think with yourself, what's the difference between us and say, for example, Ahlul Bayt of the Prophet, peace be on them. What's the difference? They are human beings, we are human beings. Especially in this uh, time of humanism or humanism, as they say, that human beings are, have all equal value. That, what's the difference? Why should we all the time say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad? We want to make dua, we start with that. We want to finish dua, we start with that. We finish with that. All the time our attention is there. Now I tell you, look, some, a great man, Allah doesn't mention him. And doesn't mention what he did. It was because of Nuh, that great soul. That man who knew God, that man who was dedicated, who was grateful, who was thankful, that the Zuriya of some were blessed. And there's another thing we, we learn from this ayah. If you are thankful, Allah isn't going to thank you alone. Allah will thank your progeny as well. Allah will not thank you in your own life. Allah will thank you forever. Allah is like this, isn't it? Innahu shakurun ghafur. He's very thankful. You do one thing for him sincerely, sincerely. You do one thing for him. It's impossible that he forgets it. Impossible. And impossible that he would not return something in place of it. He's grateful. This is his attribute. So, and this gratefulness, thankfulness, means that we appreciate what God has given us and we appreciate Him. This is very important. Someone asked Imam alayhi salam, how can we thank God? Now we ask ourselves, how can we thank God? We have nothing to give in, res in, in response of what He has given us. Who are we? We are just a small tiny creatures in this small tiny planet, in this small tiny galaxy. In this small tiny world which compared to the world of angels is nothing actually. Who are we? How do we want to thank him? Now Imam said, just know. That's, that's the thank, that's the gratefulness. Just know what is given to you is from him. That's all. You just acknowledge it. Acknowledgement means thankfulness. And why Allah wants us to thank him is, of course, beyond any need. He doesn't need us to thank him. Because that acknowledgement brings love into our heart. And that love absorbs us into him. So our thankfulness is actually rewarded by greater benefits. If you thank, I give you more. Why? Because if you thank, you come closer. If you come closer, you find more. Because the closer you go to, to God, the more abundance you find in everything. So, if you are thankful, look what Allah says about Ibrahim. Ibrahim is the hero of the Quran. I mean, if you want to say there is one personality, one persona in the Quran, which you can take as the first persona, as the hero, I say Ibrahim. Every, everything good alludes to Ibrahim. Inna Ibrahim kana ummatan qanatan lillahi hanifan wa lam yakum min al mushrikeen. Shakiran li an um. He was thankful. Because he was thankful, look what we did with him. Wa ja'alna fi zurriyatihin nubawwata wal kitab. We put prophethood and book into his, in his progeny. Why? Because he was thankful. Now, if you are thankful, now this month of Ramadan, of course, I don't want to, to preach so much. We want to get, get on with our story. But this month of Ramadan, in the middle of the night, when you're calling your Lord, remember, this calling is also coming from him. The power that keeps you wakeful to call him also comes from him and you come from him and there's nothing but him so if this feeling comes to our hearts then of course i don't say god you have to no there is not no have to there is no have to for god isn't it 
God, give me this, give me that. No. I ask with humiliation. I ask knowing that I deserve nothing. There is nothing that I deserve. But because I see that you are so merciful, I see that you are so generous, I'm asking. That's all. Because you have actually instructed me to ask. I ask. So, إِنَّهُ كَانَ عَبْدًا شَكُورًا Nuh was a thankful person. Shakur is the hyperbole of Shakir. Very thanksgiving all the time. And in hadith we have that every morning, every evening, he said several times, Oh God, I testify whatever comes to me in my faith, in my life, in my... Uh, material life in my spiritual life is all from you and a thank is due for that to you and now this is a man who had nothing of course materially who didn't have any house who was persecuted by the people who he wanted to guide for 950 years beaten every day by them and still he thought what blessing Allah has given me I mean, the blessing of life is above all other blessings, isn't it? That we do not appreciate. So, these were Banu Israel. They were brought to Egypt. Then at one point, the king of Egypt, the king of Egypt, decided that now I want to divest these people from whatever they have gained in Egypt. We don't know why this... this thought came to his mind he, because he wanted to destroy himself probably. You see how people act. Pharaoh decided that now 400 years they have lived here in, in Egypt. They have benefited from our country. They have benefited from our economy. Now they, it's time for them to give back and now I enslave them so that they work for me to give back. So they were all became slaves. And they were, after they were enslaved, their elders, their spiritual people, they told them, do not worry, there is a savior. The savior will come. And the savior, of course, was Musa, they were waiting for. They didn't know who, when what time he's going to come, but they knew that the a Savior was coming. Now, Surah Qasas starts from here. It doesn't say about past history of Banu Israel. It starts from here. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Taseen meem. Tilka ayatul kitabil mubeen. نَتْسَلُوا عَلَيْكَ مِنْ نَبَأِ مُوسَى وَفِرْعَوْنَ بِالْحَقِّ لِقَوْمٍ يُؤْمِنُونَ Now, we recite for you the story of Musa and Pharaoh in truth, the true story. Because there were many, many other stories coming from Banu Israel in the Bible. No, I want to tell you the true story. بِالْحَقِّ لِقَوْمٍ يُؤْمِنُونَ What was the story? The story begins from here, in Surah Qasas. Of course, we will talk about Surah Taha as well. Inna Fir'aun ala fil ard wa jala ahlaha shia. Fir'aun transgressed. He became arrogant. He thought that because he had power, he had control over human beings. Ala fil ard. And then he made people two types: one who should be exploited and the others who should exploit. So that means anyone, any society doing this has the habit of their own. Because Quran gives examples for, of course, the uh, qualities which are important in every society. How did he deal with them? This was very cruel. I mean, we never imagined such things happened for us when we migrated to, migrate to another society in our modern time. But God knows, you see, human beings are mad all the time. And they, they may always go in a way that 
No one can imagine. How did he do this? He killed their children. Any newborn son, he killed them. And he left babies who were female, female babies, he left them to live. He was the one, one of those who brought corruption to the earth. This was corruption. Now, why did Pharaoh think of doing such an appalling thing? Of course, he was a human being. One sometimes thinks human beings cannot do such things. I mean, you have a community, say, for example, a minority living in a society, and suddenly you decide that all boys born in this community should be killed, the females should, girls should be left so that we can enslave them. We need them to enslave them, the boys will kill. Why? Now, Remember, I said there was this story of Savior coming to Banu Israel, someone coming to save them. And one night, Pharaoh had a dream. And the dream was, all of you know, that a fire is coming from Goshen, from the, from the north. A fire coming from the north, passing over Egypt, burning his palace, leaving Banu Israel safe. And he summoned his dream interpreters. They told him that, you know what will happen? A child will be born in this enslaved community in Banu Israel, and he will destroy your power. Now, what should he do? He said, okay, what, what is the best ploy? What is the best measure? Every newborn son I kill, because the girls, the dream doesn't say the girls come, the dreams say the boys come. So what I will do, I will kill every newborn son. This is what, how it is started. He was killing their sons. Leaving the girls. Now, look how the story goes. Then this son who was going to destroy Pharaoh, he was catered for provided for and taken care of by Pharaoh himself in his palace. Look how Allah works, you see? He was killing every son so that that savior would not come about. However, he took one son from Banu Israel, he raised him in his palace, and that one son was that's one man that was that savior. This is how Allah works. Now, we had the will to uh, bless those who were dispossessed, al mustadafin We had the will to do that. These were the progeny of Ibrahim. I was not going to leave them like that. I was going to save them, certainly. These were the progeny of the man whom we took on board with Nuh. We are not going to leave them like that, unless they want to turn their back on me. And yet they have not turned their back. They are now under old pressures, persecutions, but they have not turned their back against God. And this is something we have to learn as well. So long as we don't turn our back to God, we have his blessing. As soon as we turn our backs, no matter we are Muslim, we are Shia, we are followers of Imam Mahdi, we are whatever. I mean, no one was dearest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no community dearest than these Banu Israel. Isn't it? I mean, if you read the Quran, you see how dear this community was to Allah. When they turn their back to God, there was no use of them, no use of them anymore. And Allah says, I curse them, go away, I don't want to think about you anymore. In our language, of course, if you want to translate it into language of the creation, if you turn back, if you turn your back on Allah, on God, you turn your back on all blessing, on all benefits. You turn your back on everything that is good and therefore you lose everything so this is how but Allah wanted to 
complete his blessings on Banu Israel by sending Musa, by giving them the book, by giving them the Bible, everything he wanted to complete so that they wouldn't have any pretext, any excuse saying that, well, we didn't have this, we didn't have that. Just like the, the Kufar of Quraysh, they said that in the Quran, they are quoted saying that if we had guidance like the guidance of Banu Israel or like the guidance of Christians, we would have been better than them. And then guidance came to them, they rejected it. So, and because they rejected it, Allah rejects them. So, these people were blessed and Allah wanted to complete his ni'mah, his blessing on them. And therefore, this son was born. Now, how it works, how, how, because Banu Israel were a big community, several hundred thousand probably, living in Gushen in, in one area, and in, in Memphis as well. And how could they control, I mean, which, which house is going to give birth to a son, which house is going to give birth to a daughter? Now, you can imagine how powerful Pharaoh and his administration were. When one reads the story of Pharaoh, finds out how bureaucratic that society was, how efficient the administration was. The story says there was no house in Banu Israel in which there lived a pregnant woman unless the Pharaoh, the Pharaoh's administration found out. They put a guard. A midwife, they're from themselves, not from Banu Israel, so that if the child is born a boy, they would kill him immediately. And of course, this was the case with Musa salam as well. He was born, there was a midwife there, ready, soldiers on the door, that if this child is a son, he should be killed. Now, what happened? A just a twist of heart. وَأَلْقَيْتُ عَلَيْكَ مَحَبَّةً مِنِّي I just threw a little bit of love of you into the hearts. So anyone just put a glance at your face would love you. This was what I did. This is what, how you were saved. أَلْقَيْتُ عَلَيْكَ مَحَبَّةً مِنِّي So when the midwife looked at him, a son, and the mother crying, that this son is going to, going to be killed now, she said, no, I cannot do this. I threw a little bit of love of you into the heart. That was it. If Allah wants to do something, of course, he know the best way to do it. And this was the case of this midwife. So the midwife came out, the soldiers waiting, Where's the, where's the child? Show us. We want to see him or her? Said, it was a dead girl. I buried her. How, how would the soldiers believe that? Just God put in their mind, believe it. Believe this woman. And she said, she was a dead girl. I buried Go and look into the garden. I buried her in the garden. They went in. They didn't have the... Uh, they didn't want to bother digging and looking at the dead girl and the midwife was one of the Egyptians, the midwife was trusted so they said okay and they left and Musa was safe in the house however keeping, keeping a child in the house without people knowing about him or her whatever, girl or boy, was very difficult it was not only the Egyptians who spying, were spying over Banu Israel. There were many of Banu Israel who were spying for their own, for some little money. As usually, as you see in every society, people spy on each other because of money. So how was it possible for mother of Musa to keep this son in the house well, the son would cry, the, the relatives would come and go, people would come and go. How she wanted to keep her away from the eyes of the people? Very difficult. So she didn't know what to do. 
Now, Allah says, وَأَوْحَيْنَا إِلَىٰ أُمِّ مُوسَىٰ That's the continuation in Surah Qasas. أَوْحَيْنَا إِلَىٰ أُمِّ مُوسَىٰ أَنْ أَرْضَئِيهِ We said to mother of Musa, milk him. Don't worry. When you realize that the spies have found out, then go and throw him into the river. فَإِذَا خِفْتِ عَلَيْهِ فَأَلْقِيهِ فِي Throw him into the river. This was a revelation to mother of Musa. And this shows mother of Musa was herself on her own accord a superb woman who could receive something like ilham from Allah. She should have been a Siddiqa because Siddiqat and Siddiqin, they receive these types of messages from God, just like Maryam receives message from God. Mother of Musa received this message from God as well. It didn't come to Imran, her husband, who was a prophet as well, to degree of to 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 certain degree it came directly to her awhayna ila umm musa an ardhih fa idha khifti alayhi fa alqih fi al-yam wa la takhafi wa la tahzani do not fear do not have sorrow inna raduhu ilayka we are going to bring him back to you wa ja'iluhu min al-mursalin and we are making him one of the messengers so Banu Israel found out, at least a family, that who is that savior? The savior is Musa. He's in the house. The mother now knows he's the one who's going to become a messenger, who's going to save. However, she doesn't know what to do with him in the house. She milked him for a while until the spies found out that there is a son in this house. And that is when, of course, mother of Musa took him to the river and just put him in the box and threw him into the river. And of course, you can imagine how a mother would feel about it in a river full of crocodiles and a, 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 a sort of rough river, how she would have felt about it. And that's why the Quran says she almost lost her control, was going to tell everyone that my son is in the river, go and help. However, we kept him, we contained, we kept her, contained her with faith. We'll come to that later on. So, when she, she found out that spies have realized about Musa, she went and threw him in the river. And the rest of the story, inshallah, <laughs> how the story goes and flows after that, inshallah, we leave it for tomorrow night. Wa sallallahu ala Muhammadin wa ala Tahir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Um That was a very in-depth background to the story. At one point, I thought we weren't going to actually start the story today, but thankfully he's given us a taste. So inshallah, if you come tomorrow, uh, we'll have the continuation for the rest of the four nights, inshallah. Now, we have, I think, at least ten minutes, I think maybe more, of questions. Uh, so please, again, if you just raise your hands and this microphone will come to you. And use the microphone and inshallah, as I said, try and keep it short and uh, we'll get through as many as possible. Okay, we'll start with Assalamu alaikum. Yeah, uh, you mentioned that Bani Israel wa fadlallahum ala al-alameen. What is the, that type of tafli, first of all? And the adala, does it go against the adala of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by giving them tafli against others? Thank you. Yeah, it is, uh, if, if we think about it in depth, of course, superficially, if we think about it, as usually all of us do, because we don't know what system of justice is going beneath the whole creation, and especially the human life. Initially, we think it's not justice. However, when Allah explains for us that how he rewards people, we found out that, well, this is absolute justice. Now, I tell you, if you are good, if you are thankful, 
Allah will bless your progeny because of that. And that's justice. If I'm ungrateful, Allah would not give that, that blessing to my children. Well, he shouldn't give blessing to anyone. Initially, everyone should be equal. However, because of your thankfulness, Allah blesses your progeny. Because of what you did. Because a human being is very limited in terms of his own life or her own life. However, his aspirations, ambitions, uh, feelings, love, it may continue in his or her progeny, isn't it? And if someone is really truthful in what they, they feel about God, Allah would bless them to continue that in their progeny. And that's why you see, sometimes the blessing goes beyond a person to all, isn't it? Inna Allah astafa Adama wa Nuhan wa ala Ibrahim. Not only Ibrahim, ala Ibrahim. It was all because of Ibrahim. However, it was because of Ibrahim. Why I say that? Because Allah says, after all that Ibrahim did in terms of thankfulness, servitude, love, he says, He asked for Ishaq, but we gave him Ya'qub as well. Ya'qub was son of Ishaq, of course. Israel, Ya'qub. We gave him as something, as a bonus. He didn't ask for it. He just asked for one son. We gave him Ya'qub as well. And then Ishaq and Ya'qub themselves, كُلُّمْ مِنَ الصَّالِحِينَ they were from Salihin. They created the world of themselves, didn't they? They created the Banu Israel and all these things. So it all goes with justice. Allah rewards. But His reward is not only in your lifetime. His reward can go beyond. Not only in your own self, can go beyond your own self to your family, to others. And this is how it works. Of course, certain people do not deserve this. They are given for a while and then they are it's taken back. And one other thing is very important, just because you have raised the issue. Ibrahim had another son called Madian. And that's what people of Madian were him, from him. But he's never mentioned in the Quran. And Ibrahim never says, Alhamdulillah alladhi wahaba li Madian. No. He says, Alhamdulillah alladhi wahaba ni ala al-kibar Ismaila wa Ishaq. Why? Because mawhaba that blessing, that giving, is in these two sons. That other son, he leaves, he goes to paradise, inshallah, very good, okay? But the caliber is very different. That's why I said the caliber, our caliber with caliber of Allah Muhammad is very different. Now, you don't believe me? Just recite Sahifa Sajjadiyya. You see how different we are. Your mind reels, what type of soul is this? What type of knowledge of God this man was given? and how Allah should treat him because of that. Anyhow, that, I hope that answers your question. Any other questions? So another question. Um, you mentioned that the Egyptian midwife was affected by some muhammad that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed her via the face of Nabi Musa. Uh, my question is, how did, that must have affected her free will and her, cho and her choice that if he hadn't showed her that muhammad, Musa probably would have been dead. So how does that work in the sense that as human beings on this earth we're put here by our free will to choose through the tests that Allah gives us to get to heaven. And now Allah kind of, according to how you say it, kind of curtailed that to say no. This door is closed. Well, you see, Allah did not hold her hand that don't do it, okay? It was just a feeling coming to the heart. And when Allah wants to, of course, promote uh, what He wants to happen, it happens. But in His own mysterious way, so to speak, we say Allah works in mysterious ways, isn't it? He wanted this to happen. And of course, having that mahabba doesn't take away the free will. But because of mahabba, because of love, your decision would be different, isn't it? You make a different decision. And, I mean, we, we can just think about ourselves. We all have free wills, but these free wills are limited to our feelings, our attitudes, 
our understanding, it, it all determines what decisions we are going to make. So that was not, I mean, taking away the free will. Just exactly like Pharaoh. Pharaoh also, looking at Musa, had the mahabba in him. Now we'll come later on. When Musa came back after killing that man and running away and living in Madian for a while, coming back, Pharaoh was happy because that mahabba was in his heart. And you can see, despite that love and mahabba, what he did. That now you can, you can imagine, you see, the love didn't curtail him from doing what he did. The love curtailed the midwife, but did not curtail her own. So, because he was so arrogant. I think the main question is when is the iftar served? Yusuf alayhi salam, he used to see dreams. Mm -hmm. Yes. Ibrahim alayhi salam as well in Quran yet Bahul. So now Quran, he saw the dream and the tafsir of that dream causes to kill all the boys of Bani Israel. So the dreams, what is the idea behind the dreams? Is it done by Allah? And if yes, then uh, why all these kids, all these babies, baby boys, they were dead? Is it uh, for, uh, like Taqsir of Fir'aun or? Yeah, well, good question. Uh, the dr dream is a human sort of quality. It's not related to the faithful or faithless. You see, her own and use of both see dreams. Okay, so it's not something limited to faithful people. It's a human quality we sometimes dream, and this quality, of course, there are different types of dreams. Some dreams have no interpretation at all, as uh, in case of the king of Egypt, when the interpreters he told them what he had dreamt about the seven cows and such things, they said, Qalu ahlam. These are not the interpretable dreams. Okay? Now, the interpretable dreams are the dreams when the soul in sleep connects to a higher world. And that higher world, in that higher world, the time is a bit different. The knowledge uh, can go beyond time, okay? So when we are in that situation, we see things which happen in future, because they're, they're, we are not bound by time then. However, we cannot bring it into our concepts of mind. It comes in different ways, okay? It's like, for example, the king of Egypt, he had that understanding that in future there's going to be famine, okay? but the mind couldn't put it in concepts and words. So what he saw, the concepts, was that he saw seven cow, fat cows eaten by seven uh, thin cows, for example. This is how he, on his mind translated that issue. So this is something which happens, and for Pharaoh it happened. The savior was coming, he saw that, but he saw it in form of a fire coming. I mean, he interpreted for himself in the mind, translated. Now, Pharaoh could make thousands of different decisions based on that dream. One was to say, okay, now I take the shackles off Banu Israel so that I'm saved, isn't it? One would have been that, okay, I somehow uh, try to be a better person. His arrogance actually drew him drove him to, uh, to think that, okay, by killing the sons, I can stop it. So it is all his decision, nothing to do with the dream. It's just like us, for example, if the advisors nowadays, the advisors, uh, the, uh, the experts uh, give advice to politicians that this is going to happen, for example, in the world, we predict, we predict this, they may take thousands of different decisions. But unfortunately for the politicians, they always make the worst decisions. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's how Pharaoh made that worst decision for himself. Uh, 
Thank you very much. Uh, we talked about the nobility of the ancestors of Musa. There's always something that's made me think about the story of Ibrahim Ali Salam. He was obviously a very pious man, he was honest. So in that scenario where he's destroyed all the idols and they ask him who has destroyed all these idols of Ibrahim and he points to the, the, the big idol and he says it is he. Now, how does that square with his honesty when clearly it wasn't the idol who destroyed all the other idols? Well, you actually said part of the verse. Because the full verse says, قَالَ فَعَلَهُ كَبِيرُهُمْ هَذَا فَاسْأَلُوهُ إِنْ كَانُوا يَنْتِقُونَ If they speak, he, has, he is the one who has done it. Okay. <laughs> but they don't speak, certainly. And by that, he didn't, of course, he was not afraid. He knew that eventually they, they would not accept his words. And they, they would put the, the finger at him. However, he wanted them to think that how? This idol who cannot move, how are we worshipping him? But what he said was a double sort of uh, reminder. If they speak, he has killed them, he has destroyed them, so ask him. Now, they now went to themselves, they started to talk, to think and to talk with each other. فَرَجَعُوا إِلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ قَالُوا إِنَّكُمْ أَنْتُمُ الظَّالِمُونَ They said, now you, are, you don't have any ground, you cannot argue with this man. Because he has the argument here. He says, if they speak, he has done it. They do not speak, he cannot move. So, this is how it happened. How much similarity between the Quran and Taurat in the story of Musa? Is there any similarity? Yeah, huge similarity. Of course, th there are uh, certain nuances in, in some details, but uh, uh, mainly the main story is the same. The main story of killing the Coptic person, coming out, going to Madian, coming back. It's, it's almost the same. The, the, the small details, for example, in the Quran says the wife of Pharaoh uh, adopted Musa and uh, the, the Bible says sister of her own wanted Musa to, to be saved. So small differences. I'm going to take the last question. Um, it might be a simple question, but I've never really um, sort of been content with the explanations. What, why do we have different versions? I mean, they're slightly different versions of stories in different sort of the same story as I said in Surah Musa there's more than two and it's mentioned in different places I agree in slightly different ways but is there something behind it I'm not getting or uh, there are not different versions uh, because different aspects. versions means Sorry, yeah uh, repeating it yes. repeating yes. in different places well you see each surah gives us a concept and for that concept, it draws on certain examples. Now, this story of Musa is multi-faceted uh, sort of a story. The many different aspects, many different lessons can be learned from it. And in each surah, because the aim of a surah is to give us a lesson, the example is quoted, looked at from that perspective. And that's why there are these repetitions. And sometimes, for example, we see the for example, we say in Surah Nazat the story of Musa is mentioned. Why well, it's not the story of Musa, it's the story of Pharaoh. And God wants to focus on Pharaoh rather than on Musa, begins with the Musa but focuses on Pharaoh. So in every Surah, when you look at it, you see that there are certain aspects which are not dealt with in another Surah. And it goes with the, with the theme and the aim of that Surah.